That Sunday morning, I ended up at the Home Depot store just wanting to pass the time. Although I knew I should be at church, I couldn't resist the urge to wander around the store. I didn't have any specific purchases, but I enjoyed looking at various products. For someone who doesn't like golf, it was a much more enjoyable way to spend the morning. I was lucky when, at the end of the year, I came across a grass and feed sale similar to the one I visited two years ago. It was during this shopping trip that I unexpectedly ran into Barry Bartell. Our wives often talked. We exchanged pleasantries and learned about each other's lives. Barry Bartell, a family friend whom I hadn't seen for almost a year, also turned up at the store. Even though we weren't particularly close, Barry and I decided to have coffee and chat. The conversation turned to our wives. Barry's wife Greta and my wife Sheila coincidentally left for a Caribbean cruise the next morning. Since Barry was busy at work, he couldn't join his wife on the trip, so Sheila suggested that I stay at home with the kids while she accompanies Greta. Sheila insisted that I not join them third, as it would save money for both couples if they shared a cabin on the cruise. I didn't like this situation, but I decided not to argue. It was clear where everything was going. We exchanged greetings and then went to wander around the pest control department. Barry, I was disappointed to learn that you won't be able to take a vacation to go on a cruise. I've been really looking forward to this. He wasn't the only one who couldn't take time off from work. I've already used up my vacation days, and I'll just paint the kitchen while Sheila's not at home. Sheila said you can't take time off from work. I work for my father. I can take a vacation whenever I want. Barry was about to leave, but remembering Greta's words, he said that both of us would not be able to go on a cruise. Barry and I stood in silence. The silence was interrupted by an elderly man with a cart. Are you going to stand here all day? I pushed the cart away and offered Barry a cup of coffee. He agreed. We spent the next two hours at McDonald's. It wasn't hard for us to guess that our wives had planned a seven-day Caribbean cruise without us. The real mystery was why they did it. We avoided this issue until we stopped ignoring it. It was like the proverbial elephant in the room. Finally, I plucked up the courage and asked Barry, So are they taking two guys with them or are they planning to meet strangers? He hesitated with an answer. He seemed to avoid thinking about possible answers. Barry, do you need time to think? I asked, sensing his hesitation. He didn't seem to be evading the question, but rather postponing it. I nodded in agreement and picked up my empty coffee cup. Five minutes later we were both enjoying freshly baked rolls and steaming coffee. Barry, I can't imagine Greta and Sheila starting a relationship with strangers so we're going to have to plan something in advance, I mused. Barry reluctantly agreed. I couldn't understand why they needed to go on a trip for this. Wouldn't it be easier to find someone nearby? Maybe so. To be honest, I didn't keep track of Greta's activities and whereabouts. I've always trusted her and never thought about the fact that she might be involved with someone else. Why would two mothers with school-aged children even start a new relationship? Trying to take a sip of scalding hot coffee, we finally gave up and put the cups aside thoughtfully looking out the window. It's probably a couple of colleagues. Sheila and Greta worked for the insurance company International Casualty Insurance. Barry's comments seemed logical. Is there a way to prevent this? Barry, if they're close enough to these people to vacation together, then it might be too late. What do you suggest? Do you think they have already deceived us? Unfortunately, I'm starting to suspect that this is the case. Barry got up from his seat and headed for the service desk. When he returned a minute later, he cursed to himself. 27 cents for a glass of ice? Why come here at all? We both added some ice to the hot coffee and sat in silence for a few moments. John, he began, I've noticed that Greta has been working a lot of extra hours lately. It hadn't occurred to me before. But now that he mentioned it, I began to understand what he was getting at. I'm not going to stand in Sheila's way, but I'm not going to sit back either. After finishing my Danish and drinking the rest of my coffee, I told Barry to meet me the next day after the wives left for the airport to plan something. I warned him not to hint to Greta about our secret activities. 
Barry confirmed my instructions with a thumbs up, and I left. At home, everything was as usual. Our sons Todd and Jason were engrossed in their video games. Sheila's behavior, as usual, remained unchanged. While she was preparing a light lunch, I sat and flipped through the newspaper, waiting for her to share the details of her trip. But she completely avoided the subject, which piqued my interest. After lunch, I took the boys to play soccer while Sheila packed her things at the house. She wanted everything to be ready for her departure the next morning without any hitches. Looking back at the house, I realized my mistake and wondered why I hadn't noticed it before. Todd? Jason? I'll be painting the house next week while your mom is away. How about spending this time with your grandparents? Without waiting for an answer, they quickly headed into the house to pack their things. My parents lived on a farm 20 miles from the city. They had horses, which made the task easier. Sheila complained a little, but it didn't look like she was going to make a scene. When I returned home, I found that my wife had already prepared dinner. Refreshed, Sheila went to the shower. This gave me the opportunity to discreetly inspect her belongings. My doubts were confirmed when I found three unusual items in her bag. The first was an unusual choice of sleeping accessories, which did not fit into the estimated time spent with Greta. Sheila had a working mobile phone with an international connection, and she agreed to call home daily or in case of any problems. I assured her that there was no need to worry if I didn't answer, as I might be with the boys at my parents' house or busy painting. This seemed to bring her relief. Greta was already at the terminal when I dropped Sheila off and waved to me when Sheila joined her. I couldn't wait to see Barry. When I parked, Barry met me with a couple of cups of coffee. Taking out the ice, he again expressed his disappointment. John, please tell me you have positive news, he pleaded. I could only shake my head in disappointment. Greta packed two revealing dresses and revealing underwear. I'm afraid I have some equally disturbing news, I confessed. She also packed a racy bikini and a large supply of contraceptives. Oh no, he exclaimed. I didn't even think to check it out. I didn't even look in her makeup bag. I don't know if I should be glad that I didn't find anything or regret that I didn't search more thoroughly. Barry and I spent the next 20 minutes discussing our conflicting emotions. After a coffee break, we headed to the International Casualty Insurance Company. Passing by the secretary, we asked for an interview with Kermit Templeton, the head of the Human Resources Department. Kermit was a high school acquaintance of ours, and although we weren't particularly close, we had a good relationship. Kermit's expression when he met us was not very friendly. Close the door, okay? He asked as Barry and I settled into uncomfortable chairs. You know why we're here, Kermit, don't you? I asked. I guess... He replied, becoming serious. Barry and I exchanged smiles, but Kermit remained unperturbed. We were hoping that you would tell us how many people from the company are going on vacation this week, Barry asked. Is that a question? Kermit replied, his tone was harsh. Our smiles faded, and Kermit's attitude softened as he reluctantly provided us with the information we were looking for. Including Sheila and Greta, 14 people are on vacation, he said. Could you print out a list for us? I asked. No, but I can give you what you need, Kermit replied, typing on the computer. He handed us two sheets of paper and waited for our reaction. Flipping through the pages, Barry and I found detailed information about Clayton Mank and Calvin Bostick. These two are on the same cruise ship as Greta and Sheila, Barry noted. Kermit nodded, taking our hint. Then there is no need for the rest of the list. That's what you wanted to know, he said. Curious, Barry asked. Do you know who's with whom? In response, Kermit showed pictures of Calvin, hinting at a deeper connection. Does anyone else know about this? I asked, realizing the gravity of the situation. After trying to solve this problem, we eventually gave up. It was common knowledge for all of us. I got the impression that the company has a strict policy against such behavior, but it seems that this policy only applies if a complaint is filed. As a rule, the consequences are minimal, just a slap in the face. But if we insist on further action, 
the situation may become more complicated. When we were asked if we would complicate the situation, Barry and I exchanged tacit agreement. At 10 o'clock in the evening, Kermit informed us that if all four people were still working next week, a lawsuit would be filed. We didn't know the details at the time, but a trial was inevitable. We expressed regret over the current situation, clarifying that the relationship was consensual and did not force anyone. But we knew about the existence of such a relationship and decided not to take any action because no one came with a complaint. By 11 o'clock, it was decided that if the four employees were not fired, then legal action would be taken without hesitation. Barry and I shook Kermit's hand as we left. We planned to meet with a lawyer, have lunch, and then visit a travel agency to discuss our next steps. When we parked the cars and headed to the lawyer's office, Barry suddenly stopped in place. I looked at him puzzled. What happened? I asked. Barry turned to me and asked, John, what exactly are we going to ask a lawyer to do for us? I was stunned by his skepticism. Well, we're getting divorced. We will finally be free of these lying wives, I replied confidently. But Barry shook his head, expressing his doubts. Think about it, John. As soon as we cross the threshold of this door, it will cost us a pretty penny. We will pay alimony for the house, for the maintenance of the children, and who knows what else. We will drown in bills and at the same time have to provide for our ex-wives. What do we get out of all this? Nothing but a lightning of the purse, Barry hotly objected. His words made me think. Why would anyone in their right mind go through with a divorce if it means financial ruin and endless obligations? This thought haunted me as we stood outside the lawyer's office, thinking about the consequences of our decision. The only reason I can think of is so that I can see my children. Barry, why did you make it so difficult? I love my children and I don't want to lose them. I understand your feelings, John. I can't bear the thought of not being able to see my sons anymore, but I also can't let my wife's actions ruin my life. It seems that the only fair solution is to take custody of the children and make her pay for what she did. But we both know that's never going to happen. It feels like we are being blackmailed. We stood in silence in the parking lot, feeling the weight of the unfair laws that govern our lives. Barry, I have to admit that Sheila is a good mother. I don't think I'd be as good as she is if I had kids. Yes, Greta is also a good mother. The girls love her. No matter what, she would probably be a better parent than me, even though she betrayed me. We leaned against the hood of my car, lost in our thoughts. I kicked the gravel under my feet, and Barry fumbled with the zipper of his jacket. John, let's go eat some ribs. We ate and drank several bottles of beer, trying to distract ourselves. After sobering up, we went to the Good Times Travel Agency, where we met Nancy Rayburn, a family friend who became an ex-girlfriend. Everyone in our circle of friends relied on Nancy's travel planning services, which allowed her to stay afloat in the face of fierce competition on the internet. When we entered her office, we saw the panic in her eyes, and she didn't need to say a word. Barry and I sat down and smiled at the weapons of our destruction. The other agents in the office quickly scattered, leaving Nancy alone with us. At two o'clock in the afternoon, we saw one of the agents pick up a brown bag from his desk, a clear sign that they knew what was going to happen. Nancy tried to pull herself together, but the tension in the room was palpable. Finally, unable to hold back any longer, she asked what we needed. Barry and I exchanged glances and burst out laughing, making Nancy squirm uncomfortably in her seat. Leaning closer, I whispered a threat that made her eyes widen in fear. It was clear that our visit would not end well for her. Hey guys, give me a break. I'm not going to tell you more than what your wives did. You're not going to do anything stupid, right? Barry got up and headed for the entrance to the office, where there were two more agents and a couple planning a trip. Listen up, guys. I suggest you leave the office for a while, as we are going to rearrange the furniture. Barry announced. Wait a minute. What do you want? Just don't get me or the office into trouble. I don't need any extra publicity. The Good Times Travel Agency was a franchise, 
and over the last year Nancy had some problems that she didn't want to make public. Barry suggested that everyone relax and take their seats. Nancy, who else went with Sheila and Greta, I asked. There are more than a thousand passengers on the ship. You know what I mean, Nancy? Who else from international casualty is on this ship? I can't divulge this information. Nancy, which cabins are Sheila and Greta staying in? They're booked on sunset deck in room 113, Nancy replied. I expressed my disappointment. That's not what I asked, is it? What are you trying to achieve, John? What do you want from me? Which rooms are Calvin Bostick and Clayton Menka staying in? She hesitated, her worried expression matching her uncertainty. Before I could react, Nancy stuttered out the room numbers, and I banged my fist on the table. The other travel agents jumped in surprise when the two customers silently left. Damn it, Nancy! What rooms do they live in? Tell me now and stop fooling around. If necessary, I will tear this place apart. Bostick and Menka on sunset deck number 115, Nancy whispered with fear in her voice. Barry looked up at her. Does Calvin share a room with my wife Greta? Nancy shuddered, trying to move away from the table. Tell me, do Greta and Calvin live in the same room? Another fist bump on the table. Yes, Nancy managed to say. They both live in room 113th, and Sheila and Clayton live in room 115th. It wasn't me who ordered it, it was them. I was just following their instructions. It's not my responsibility. Nancy paused, realizing that she had revealed too much. Please take a copy of the itinerary and any information you need for the cruise. Nancy typed on the computer and took out two folders from the file cabinet, passing them to us across the table. I suspected that she might have shed tears, but I couldn't be sure. As we prepared to leave I looked sternly at her face. Do not inform anyone on this ship or elsewhere of our presence or of this conversation. If you do, I can guarantee that your business will be destroyed by the end of the month. We left the building, and Barry looked at me, doubting our next move. How are we going to pull this off? Grace, Marie, and Beth, his sister and two teenage daughters, were supposed to arrive at the house later. We spent the evening studying brochures and schedules, easily developing a plan. We both recognized that our marriages are beyond repair and agreed not to fight for what we have. Most of all, we were worried about our children. We cherished them very much and thought about how the divorce would affect them and how we would experience it ourselves. We agreed not to get divorced and take responsibility for taking care of the children in our own way. I was hoping to eventually arrange with Sheila to live together so that I could be with them when everything calmed down. I planned to provide the children with food and money, but I wasn't going to financially support Sheila. This will require careful planning and effort. If everything went smoothly, I was also going to pay for their college tuition. Tonight, we needed to discuss how to solve the current problems. Fortunately, there was free Wi-Fi on the cruise ship. Barry planned to transfer all the contact information of our friends, relatives, and colleagues to his laptop. Although the mobile phone numbers presented a certain problem, we decided not to worry about them. Their cruise was scheduled to arrive in Montego Bay on Wednesday morning, so we booked an inexpensive early morning sightseeing flight to get there by 7 in the morning. In less than an hour, we managed to arrange a flight to Jamaica and book a room for the return flight. Sheila called to say that they were settled in the cabin and had already gone to sea. She mentioned that Greta was also on board and asked me to give this message to Barry. The evening was just beginning, and we were almost ready to sail. Tomorrow, we planned to spend the day sorting out our financial and personal affairs, including bank accounts, bills, credit cards, and personal belongings. I intended to take my things to my parents' house for storage. A kind colleague offered to park our cars at his place. We had to be taken to the airport, as we did not want to leave at midnight, but it was necessary. The taxi ride from the airport to the cruise ship parking lot was short. While we waited at the market stall, we admired the stunning sunset. 
All we had were two carry-on bags and Barry's laptop. Choosing casual clothes, we collected the most necessary things. Soon after, the first passengers disembarked from the ship. Some went to the city, others boarded tour buses lined up in a row. The scene was perfectly staged, as if it had been rehearsed countless times. Sheila and Greta walked down the path, smiling broadly. The two men following them looked equally pleased. When they intertwined their fingers, it became clear which of them was Clayton and which was Calvin. Handsome and young, they seemed a little younger than Barry and me, but certainly not as rude as Macho Hans. We watched them from our seats until they all boarded the bus. Barry waved to the ticket collector as they drove off. Barry greeted the ticket clerk with a wave of his hand and then struck up a conversation with the driver. After a brief exchange of opinions, he headed towards us. Known for his love of bargaining, he spent five minutes and two hundred dollars to convince him to help us. Without hesitation, we pointed out Sheila and Greta to our newfound companion, who readily agreed to take as many photos of these two couples at the waterfall as possible. When we mentioned our desire to take some bold shots, he grinned and gave us a thumbs up. The bus was supposed to return at three o'clock. We promised to leave him the money. He smiled again and explained that the camera was good, and then slyly hinted that he needed $200 more. When the buses left, we headed to our room on board, and for an extra $100, a helpful clerk registered us under the names Bob Jones and James Moore. If everything goes according to plan, we will be incognito throughout the cruise. After a quick snack of sandwiches, we spent the rest of the day studying the layout of the ship. In just a few hours, we got to know all the stairs, elevators, and passageways. We tried to avoid the dining room and the exhibition hall so that our wives would not accidentally recognize us. Barry set up his laptop and ran some tests, confirming that we had no problems with internet access and email. We briefly thought about breaking into our wives' rooms, but eventually abandoned the idea. When we were comfortably seated in the same booth, the buses began to return, and the one heading to Dance River Falls arrived exactly on schedule. Barry and I were sipping red when Sheila, Greta, and their lovers walked past us. The straw hats we put on probably helped us blend in a bit with the crowd. Our new acquaintance came up to us with a wide grin on his face. There was something impatient in that smile. He couldn't wait to show us his work, and he didn't stop bragging about how great he had done until Barry handed him a cold beer. It was only a few seconds before we looked at the photos. There was a lot more tenderness on them than we expected. I handed him $200 and another beer for the driver. After making sure that the wives had safely left the boarding area, we returned to the cabin. We had a busy night ahead of us, but first we had to figure out how to have a quiet dinner. The cabin had a balcony overlooking the main entrance to the dining area. Barry and I made ourselves comfortable and watched the passengers lining up for food. We guessed that the wives would prefer an early dinner. The four of them quickly reached the place and lined up in a row, wanting to get more time for evening entertainment and dancing. Walking hand in hand, they looked like happy spouses. Barry gave me a puzzled look as I got up and went to the office phone. Just 30 seconds later, I came back with a huge grin on my face. The couples were about to take their seats when an announcement rang out calling for Barry Bartell to join the party on the Lido deck. It wasn't a particularly loud or intrusive announcement, but it caught everyone's attention. Greta immediately turned her head, as if trying to find the source of the announcement. She and Sheila were deep in conversation, while Clayton and Calvin waited patiently nearby. Greta tried to call someone on her phone, but after 30 seconds there was no answer. Then Sheila called, prompting concerned stares from the staff. After receiving no response, they all went to the dining area. It was amazing, John. It's a pity we can't eavesdrop on their conversation during dinner. Barry jokingly remarked as we greeted each other and went to enjoy tacos and margaritas on the sunset deck. An hour later, we returned to the room energized and ready for a fun evening. Today, we had a day at sea, and arrival in Cancun was scheduled for the next morning. No one answered the phone at any of our houses, 
and no one seemed to know that we were out of town. Even if they tried to call our parents or Barry's brother, they wouldn't be able to pinpoint our exact location. We spent the whole day uploading to our laptop all the photos from the excursion to the Dance River waterfall. The pictures captured the moments when all four cheaters were together, but mostly they were hugging and kissing couples. In some of the pictures, Sheila stood out in her new orange bikini. It looks like she had a wardrobe malfunction on the way to the waterfall, as she giggled every time. Although a video would have been ideal, we had to settle for what we had. Barry created a collage page with the best photos of Clayton and Calvin. Each of us chose our favorite frame, which Barry used to create an e-card with the message, Having a great time, I wish you were here. By 9 o'clock we had sent out more than 200 letters. I was amazed by the abundance of friends, relatives and social ties that united us. Naturally all employees of International Casualty received a set of photos. Despite the incredibly strong wind and the almost empty deck, Barry and I managed to find a quiet, secluded place. Barry and I had three cocktails each, enjoying a successful first day. Not knowing the plans for the next day, we decided to try to repeat the trick with the page, since it turned out to be so successful. We went to bed early. Danish and coffee were served throughout the ship for breakfast. We decided to avoid crowded dining rooms and common areas, preferring service stairs to elevators. Barry and I were sitting on the back deck, sipping rum drinks with pineapples, overlooking the bustling main pool. We were finishing our second drink when Sheila and Greta appeared and settled comfortably into a pair of deck chairs. Clayton and Calvin were noticeably absent. Not knowing what to do next, we watched the surrounding situation. At the other end of the deck, a bored teenager caught our attention engrossed in his mobile phone. Impressed by the speed of his correspondence, I nudged Barry, and we cautiously approached him. It was a little awkward trying to strike up a conversation with a young guy on a cruise ship and not seem strange at the same time, but we coped with this task. In the end, he agreed to let us use his cell phone for 20 bucks. Hi Sheila, this is John. I'm sorry I missed your call last night. I tried to call three times, but I had to use another phone because mine doesn't work. It's okay, I'm just busy. Are you having fun? Having fun? It's a pity that you couldn't join us. Give my regards to Greta. I need to get this guy's phone back. Before we end the conversation, I have to say that you look amazing in that orange bikini. I don't remember seeing him before. Take care of yourself. Wait, John. Barry and I burst out laughing when I handed the phone back. Before returning it, we made sure to block calls from Sheila and Greta. I handed the guy another $20 and told him to forget he'd seen us. He thought it was a good idea and quickly agreed. Sheila and Greta were looking for me all over the ship. Sheila tried to disguise herself by wrapping a large towel around herself, but it was a stupid move. After two unsuccessful attempts to get through to the specified number, she gave up the idea. Clayton and Calvin soon joined them. Barry immediately went to the service phone on deck. A few minutes later, they announced, Barry Bartell, please join your shuffleboard party. As soon as this announcement was made, there was a lot of activity around the pool. Greta and Sheila quickly grabbed their belongings and headed for the shuffleboard deck on the left side of the yacht, while Clayton and Calvin stood looking displeased. We watched our wives leave. After waiting for half an hour, Greta and Sheila went to their room. Sheila called on the phone, and we could tell by the look on her face that the postcards had already arrived. It doesn't matter who she called, because everyone who knew us had seen pictures of Sheila and Greta with their lovers. They stared at the photos on Sheila's mobile phone for a while before heading to the cabin deck. That evening, Clayton and Calvin went to dinner without their companions. They spent the rest of the evening drinking in a cabaret bar on the deck of the lagoon. Barry and I have been sitting in the far corner all this time, enjoying beer and pizza. They were so engrossed in their fun that they didn't even notice us. We briefly thought about getting closer and eavesdropping on their conversation, but in the end, we refused. Our wives were nowhere to be seen. By midnight, they both left the bar in a state of heavy intoxication. 
It took several crew members to help them back to their cabins. We never found out how they managed to fall asleep that night. But to be honest, we didn't care. While we were enjoying breakfast on the sun deck with fresh fruits and coffee, the Diamond Sunset ship docked in Cancun. Many passengers were standing on the promenade deck, looking forward to the start of the day. Not knowing our plans, we did not dare to join the two couples who went ashore. But soon our attention was attracted by Sheila and Greta, who were among the first to get off the ship with their suitcases. Instead of going on a day trip, they were going to leave the cruise after getting off the ship. While the rest of the tourists boarded the tour buses, Sheila and Greta jumped into a taxi and drove away. Barry and I exchanged last greetings, both surprised by this turn of events. We assumed that our wives would eventually find us on the ship, but they didn't seem to put any effort into it. Clayton and Calvin also joined the tour bus, their expressions vague. We enjoyed lunch in the almost deserted dining room, not knowing what the rest of the day would bring us. Before heading home, the ship made one last stop in Grand Cayman. When Sheila and Greta were not at home, we felt calmer and more relaxed. While most of the passengers were exploring the island, Barry and I decided to have a leisurely lunch in the dining room. We knew we needed to start planning our stay in the Cayman Islands, but for now, we were just enjoying the moment. Later in the evening, we planned to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Clayton and Calvin, although we weren't sure what we were going to say. The seats in the formal dining room were distributed. Our wives and their boyfriends took a table for four. Two seats remained unoccupied. Barry and I waited for Clayton and Calvin to take our seats, and then casually walked over to their table and joined them. Surprisingly, no one tried to stop us or inquire about our presence. Good evening, gentlemen. I suppose you know who we are, right? Calvin nodded slightly in approval, and Clayton just grinned. His eyes darted between us, and his head was tilted forward with a clear expression of displeasure. Calvin looked nervous and uncertain, and Clayton's expression was just angry. Gentlemen, Mr. and I will not join you for dinner, I announced solemnly. There are only three days left until the end of the cruise, and we thought it necessary to warn you to be extremely careful. I heard Barry's muffled laugh, but ignored it. Calvin looked intrigued, but Clayton frowned even more. Just remember that every year 222 people fall overboard on pleasure cruises and are never found, I added, pausing before we got up and left the dining room. Calvin's voice followed us, but I couldn't make out his words. For dinner, Barry and I chose tacos and beer, avoiding the windy veranda, but admiring the beautiful sunset through the windows. Everything went well, Barry remarked. As we reflected on the past evening, I couldn't help but wonder if our warning had really had an effect. Let's see how they react tomorrow, I suggested. But our plans took an unexpected turn when Mr. Sorensen contacted us the next day. Gentlemen, give me a moment of your time, he began, followed by two other crew members. Barry and I turned to face the imposing Nordic man and exchanged uncertain glances. We exchanged smiles and nodded at the authoritative figure standing in front of us. Have we already talked to Mr. Jones and Mr. Moore? Or maybe Mr. Bartell and Mr. Connor? There was no point in misleading them about our true identities. They mentioned that some of our passengers said they felt threatened by us and claimed that we had threatened to throw them off the ship. We explained that we had only shared the statistics of accidents at sea and advised them to be careful. Despite our intentions, it was perceived as a veiled threat. The conversation turned into another direction when the big Swede gestured to a quieter part of the room. It became clear that we had indeed made statements that could be interpreted as threats against Mr. Bostwick and Mr. Menka. Barry and I exchanged knowing glances, after which we admitted that although there was no obvious threat in our words, they were said with a certain intention. Was there a reason for this threat? Of course there were, and you were part of that reason judging by the look on your faces. Mr. Sorensen, Nordic Cruise Lines has arranged for these two men to share cabins with our wives. Mr. Bostick spent a week with Mrs. Bartell, and Mr. Menka shared a cabin with my wife. 
It seems that the company Nordic Cruise Lines is organizing something like a cruise with entertainment on the high seas. You are targeting married women who want to spend time with their lovers. Although I am sure that the law protects you in such matters, it seems very unsightly to me. Mr. Connor, I can understand your frustration with your wife's actions, but of course, you don't think the cruise company encourages or condones such behavior. We are a family-oriented company and we intend to remain so. Barry and I were at a loss. We had something to say, but we decided to keep quiet for now. We leaned back in our chairs and exchanged smiles. Sorensen looked slightly flustered, but he kept the situation under control. Unfortunately, we have to inform the relevant authorities about this. They'll probably have questions for you. What organs? We are on the high seas. Mr. Connor, Mr. Bartell, I must ask you to refrain from any contact with Mr. Menka and Mr. Bostic until the end of the cruise. Can you assure me that you will not create any problems upon arrival in Miami? Barry and I smiled and nodded in agreement. The rest of the group disappeared, leaving us to strategize alone. We spent the evening in the cabin, addressing various media outlets with exaggerated stories and even made-up details. We attached the photos, knowing that they should not be published, but hoping to attract attention. The next morning, we enjoyed a hearty breakfast in the dining area. Clayton and Calvin were absent from the meal, and later we noticed untouched breakfast plates next to them. When the ship arrived in the Grand Cayman Islands, we watched Calvin leave with his luggage, leaving Clayton. Barry and I decided to explore the island, enjoying swimming with manta rays, but still unable to get rid of our thoughts. This was the only activity during our entire trip that was not dictated by revenge. Later in the evening, we enjoyed a hearty dinner again, and Clayton was still not in sight. Barry received more than 30 letters responding to the postcard we sent out, but most of them were not serious, although some were serious or critical of our actions. Nevertheless, we were glad that our message reached the target audience, as friends and acquaintances found it funny. But the family members did not share this mood, and scolded us for our actions. Despite the fact that there was no news from Sheila and Greta, we made sure that our phones were fully charged. Before going to bed, we sent out 32 press releases, although we hardly knew how to prepare and send them correctly. One of them was directed against Piccolo World Tours, the company that owns the franchise of the travel agency Good Time, in which we may have gone too far by accusing Nancy Rayburn of planning a trip. We may have exaggerated a bit to get our point across to her, but we were just trying to get through to her, and she needed to hear it. This story has made headlines and on television, but we hope it will spark a much-needed discussion. Despite the drama, we had a wonderful day and a quiet night. The next morning we had breakfast together on the terrace of the Lido Hotel. Barry checked his phone and saw that he had six missed calls, all from his sister. My father was the only one who stayed at home. Since mom went to the hospital, she has always had high blood pressure. After going about our business, we finally decided to make the first call. Dad, this is John. I noticed that you tried to call me. Well, son, it looks like you have more information than I do. All I know is that Sheila arrived on Wednesday and took the boys with her. I remember you told me not to let her take them, but I couldn't stop her explained the father. Later I went into the house but she was nowhere to be found. The front door was unlocked, so I went inside to check. She collected almost all of her clothes and the children's clothes, which suggests that she was in a hurry to leave. She didn't mention her destination, but Jason seemed pleased when she mentioned Noble's Grove and wrote me a note, leaving it on his bed. Sheila's sister Loretta lives in Noble's Grove, so that's probably where she went. I'll try to find Loretta's phone number and call her. John, we received a postcard with photos. Could you explain what's going on? It seems pretty obvious, Dad. Sheila went on a cruise with a colleague. I made sure to lock the house, her father said. I do not know the reasons for her departure. What are your plans now? I do not know for sure. 
but I think we will see each other in a day or two. In the meantime, I'll keep you posted. Thanks for calling. While I was talking to my dad, Barry poured himself a cup of coffee. He looked unhappy. We both assumed that our wives would return to take care of the children and discuss the possibility of living elsewhere for a few months until we decided on our next actions. Upon arrival, we decided to look for a job in the Pensacola area. Barry returned with a dejected look and taking a Danish dish from the buffet, sank into a chaise long opposite me. You look as cheerful as I do, I said. My interlocutor smiled faintly and sighed. She's gone, John. Greta left and left the children with my sister. Did she leave the children? I was stunned. What did she say to Beth? Nothing special, Barry replied. I just thanked her for looking out for them. After chatting with the girls for a while, Beth mentioned that her car was full of clothes. It's strange how she found out that I left the children with her, especially considering that she left alone. When asked about the house, Beth's husband confirmed that no one was inside. Although all the furniture and things were in their places, Greta no longer lived there. He didn't look inside, but he suspects that all her clothes are gone. Unfortunately, everything didn't go as planned for me either. Sheila discovered that the boys were at my parents' house and took them away from there. She went to her sister's house in Nobles Grove, but I can't say for sure that's what my son wrote in the note. She collected all her clothes and the boys' clothes. It looks like my house is empty now, too. We sat in silence for a while until Barry looked at me. I know it's early, but I wouldn't mind a beer. We went to the Lido Lounge and drank more beer than usual. The bartender kindly informed us that the lounge was closing, and we returned to the cabin, where our belongings were packed and waiting for us in the aisle. We were told that the authorities would meet with us to discuss our behavior, although we were not sure who exactly they were referring to. But no one came to pick us up from the ship, and there was no media attention, as we had hoped. Everything was pretty bleak. Barry and I sat silently in the limo at the airport, returning home with one-way tickets that cost us a tidy sum. Our plans didn't come true, and we felt depressed. Barry had kids, but he didn't have a wife anymore, and neither did I. The return to the empty house was gloomy, and Sheila was nowhere to be seen. I tried to call her at her work number, but there was no answer. I found out that she no longer works at International Casualty, and assumed that Greta Clayton and Calvin were no longer there either. The first day was spent cleaning the house and getting rid of unnecessary or missing items of Sheila. Barry was also adjusting to the changes, with only a slight reminder of Greta's departure. Beth mentioned that Greta cried when she said goodbye to her daughters. We have taken measures to secure credit cards and finances. Despite my initial disappointment, I understood that Sheila had to take care of Todd and Jason. It was important for their mother to protect and provide for them. Greta didn't seem to want to take any chances. The situation seemed to be going well for the children. Barry and his daughters were getting used to the new daily routine. Beth looked after the girls while Barry was at work and helped around the house. My life has changed dramatically. Instead of the usual TV and dinners in the microwave, I decided to dig into myself a little. I discovered that Calvin Bostick left town immediately after he was fired, and Clayton was also fired, leaving no information about his current whereabouts. I contacted Sheila's sister Loretta, hoping to find out about the children, but she had no information. Loretta claimed that Sheila stayed in the house only for one night, and then disappeared without saying a word. I wondered if my son had lied to me by leaving his note. Maybe Sheila made him do it, I thought. I was skeptical about Loretta's story, but until I found out the truth myself, I had no choice but to trust her words. It may seem strange, but Barry and I have drifted apart. He had a family, but I had nothing. I tried to spend time with him and his daughters, but I always felt awkward. When the new school year began, I visited the administrative office of the previous boys' school to make sure that Todd and Jason's records were transmitted correctly. 
A friendly young woman assured me that the documents had been sent to North St. Jokely Elementary School in Frackville two weeks earlier, and she seemed happy to share this information. I sincerely thanked her. Finding out Sheila's new mobile phone number turned out to be a piece of cake. After dialing the number three times, she finally picked up the phone. The caller ID can be useful, but it can also be used to evade calls. I did not prolong the conversation and offered to meet at the food court in the Frackville Mall. I waited patiently for her arrival for more than 30 minutes. It was our first conversation since her romantic cruise, and I tried not to bring it up. When I sat down at the table, there was an impressive cup of coffee in front of me. By the time Sheila sat down at the table, her seat was already empty. There was an awkward silence as we avoided greeting each other. In the end, I had to interrupt this moment. I want you and the boys to go back to the house, I said firmly. Sheila was sitting awkwardly on a hard plastic seat at the mall. She didn't take the drink before sitting down, leaving her hands empty. Are all four of us together? Did I understand you correctly? She asked. No, just you and the boys, I clarified. I have a small apartment nearby. Todd and Jason will be more familiar and comfortable in the house. They will be able to return to their old school, and I will be able to see them regularly, I explained. I can't afford to live in this house, but I will pay for rent and utilities. I will give money for food and other household expenses as well as for clothes and school needs of the boys. Sheila hesitated. What about me then? I replied, you're a grown woman now, Sheila. I believe you can take care of yourself. You'll need to find a job, but we can arrange for you to work while the boys are at school. She reluctantly agreed to look after the boys in the evenings, feeling mixed feelings. Not knowing what to hope for or agree to, she looked around the mall uncertainly. The offer had both positive and negative sides. Okay, I'll do it for the boys, she finally agreed. You're right. It's better for them. When do you want us to move in? In the next few days, I said, concluding the contract. The conversation was fast. It took almost no time compared to the uncomfortable waiting on a hard chair. After a moment of silence, she asked if I was going to discuss anything else, but I decided to leave. Without answering, I got up and put the empty cup on the table. As I was leaving, I thought I saw a small tear in her eyes before I left the mall. Looking back, it could be said that she was still sitting there as the next six months passed without any major incidents. Sheila found a job that allowed her to work while the boys were at school and we made a schedule for caring for them. Barry received a divorce petition from his wife in Nevada, but it seems the family supported him in this situation. At that time, my work was going better than expected. Unfortunately, in order to advance in the company, I will have to move. Given the current situation, I didn't want to move. Christmas was approaching, and everything went awry. When I returned from lunch, I was surprised to find Todd and Jason waiting for me in the office. Confused, I asked why they weren't at school. Todd explained that the heater had broken and they had been sent home. Jason was silent, staring at his feet. I was stunned by their unexpected presence. First we went home, and then we decided to come here. The key was under the mat so you could get in, right? Now they were both looking at the floor, wondering what was going on and what was hiding. Jason finally decided to join in the conversation, spoke quickly and seemed to stumble a little. He said that when they got home, Mom somehow left the bedroom door open and ended up inside with a guy named Clayton. It's shocking that Clayton was in the house, in her bedroom. Dad, they behaved in an inappropriate way. They were both naked and engaged in intimacy. I was speechless. How could I let this happen? Jason handed me his phone. Look, I took pictures. It didn't take long to confirm their words. Todd hinted that Clayton had visited them several times, and Sheila asked them to keep it a secret from me. She warned me that if I found out, they would have to leave Frackville. After consulting, we decided that the guys would move in with me. I handed them the keys to the apartment, and they set off. Then I went to the HR department. Despite the fact that North Dakota was not a luxurious place, 
there was immediately a vacancy that I could fill. After settling some financial issues, I returned home. Sheila wasn't there, apparently she was at work. The unmade bed hinted that she had taken a nap after lunch. I didn't know Clayton was still in the house. When I was finishing loading the boy's belongings into the car, she came in the front door, expressing dissatisfaction with my actions. She was furious, insisting that we had made a deal and that I couldn't take the boys. Despite her protests, I was determined to leave with the boys. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I was determined to take them with me. If you want them back, you can go to court and explain everything to them. What does that mean? What is it? She asked, folding her hands on her hips and grinning defiantly. I put the last bag on the floor and turned to my wife, who was standing with a confident look. What did you do for lunch today, dear? I asked. She snapped. What the hell does this have to do with the case? What do you care what I did for lunch? It's none of your damn business. Her confidence faltered, and she sat down on the sofa in the living room, remaining silent. Heading for the door, I said, Did you know that the heating system at school broke down today? The oven went out of order, and all the children were sent home during lunch. I turned to her and repeated my question. What did you do for lunch today? She didn't say anything. And as I was leaving the room, I remembered. Jason took photos. I hope Clayton has health insurance because this time he will need it. I didn't touch him before, but now he has to face the consequences. She didn't shed a tear or collapse in shock. Instead, she sat like a lifeless shell. I tried to close the door carefully, not wanting to spoil the atmosphere. By the end of the week, we had bought a small trailer and packed all our belongings. As I drove past Clayton Menka's house, the landlord informed me that he had left the day before without leaving an address. I decided that Clayton was a project for another time. I found out that Sheila consulted with a lawyer about custody of the boys but never contacted me about it. We settled into our new home easily, and the boys were happy with everything. Surprisingly, they didn't miss their mother. It was only six months later that I received the divorce papers from Carson City, Nevada. Sheila didn't demand anything, and I didn't offer anything either. The fact that she didn't fight for custody of her sons always weighed on me. I often think about it, but I never bring it up. I think it's very important for boys to have a mother in their lives. Next week, I plan to start looking for a new mother for them with the help of Todd and Jason. Two years later, I had a happy family of five. I met a beautiful woman who loved my sons very much and gave birth to my daughter. A beautiful, healthy daughter, who is now three months old. And Sheila has never found her happiness. She is lonely and unhappy. Having lost her family, she fell into a deep depression and rarely leaves the house. According to friends, her parents have to provide for her and pay for her treatment. From the fact that she had been pouring alcohol and smoking into grief for a long time, she was diagnosed with a stomach ulcer. Sheila has turned into an unhappy and suffering woman with health problems. But she deserves it. Everyone should be punished for their sins. I was looking out the window, watching the car slowly pull out of the driveway, then turn right and disappear into the street. Surprisingly, I didn't have the expected emotional reaction. Ten years of my life flew by, and I just shrugged my shoulders dispassionately. Perhaps I should have felt some sadness or regret, but instead I felt nothing but indifference. Shaking my head, I decided to distract myself and fix the dripping faucet in the kitchen. As I headed for the sink, I mentally replayed the events of the last half hour in my head. When I got home from work, I was surprised to see my wife Peggy already sitting at the kitchen table with a full glass of wine in front of her. Not that she came home before me, because she usually came half an hour or an hour after me. The fact that dinner was not being prepared, and the unusual presence of a glass of wine only reinforced my suspicions that something was wrong. Peggy rarely drank, and I realized that she had something important on her mind. Wasting no time, she asked me to sit down and gloomily admitted that she wanted to tell me something. I took a beer from the fridge and sat down across from her. She looked at me and said, Rob, 
I know you noticed that too. There has been some distance between us for the last six months. I can't pinpoint exactly why we're moving away from each other on my side or on your side. I've tried to discuss this with you, but all you're saying is that we're going through a difficult period and everything's going to get better. I've come to the conclusion that we need to be apart for a while. Not a divorce, but just a temporary separation. I feel like I need to be alone, Rob. I want to take a step back, evaluate my life and try to understand where this gap between us came from. Maybe this time apart will give us both a chance to reflect on our relationship from different perspectives, she said. Come on, Peg. It's not that bad. Every marriage has its difficulties, but we won't be able to solve our problems if we don't stay together and communicate, I replied. Talking won't change anything, Rob. You see only one problem in our marriage. The only problem for you is that we are not close, she said sadly. You're offering to solve our problem so that I can undress and let you and make love to you. But in fact, there are deeper problems between us. We don't share intimate moments anymore because I don't want to anymore. I cannot explain why I recoil from your touch, although my love for you remains unshakable. Something's wrong, and I need to be alone, Rob. I need time to sort out my feelings and thoughts. It's not about throwing decades of marriage away. It's about finding a way to get back together. I feel like we need to take a break. I packed my things in the car, and I'm going to stay with my sister until I find a new place to live. I will definitely call you once a week to stay in touch. With that, she got up and said she had to leave to meet Mary at 7. She left without kissing me goodbye, leaving me with a clear understanding of where I was. The news of our separation did not immediately spread among our friends. Most of them supported me and tried to cheer me up during this difficult time. Every week, Peggy called me to check in and ask how I was doing. I always told her that I was coping, and then I asked her how she was holding up. Her answer was always the same. She was fine. Then I cautiously asked if she was ready to go home, but I got the same answer. Not yet. As the weeks passed, disturbing rumors began to spread. I've heard rumors that Peggy has a boyfriend she lives with. I refused to believe it. I clung to the hope that everything was as she had told me, that she just needed to be alone to collect her thoughts before returning home. Unable to get rid of the rumors, I decided to take matters into my own hands and investigate. Determined to get to the truth, I went to find out where Peg was staying, planning to work undercover to put an end to the rumors once and for all. But my attempts were unsuccessful. No one wanted or could provide me with any information. Disappointed and suspicious, I confided in my friends Tom and Tay over dinner, expressing my intention to hire a private investigator to track down Peg and find out the truth behind the rumors. As I was talking, I noticed a silent exchange between Tom and Taya that made me wonder if they knew more than they were saying. Save your money, Rob, Tom advised. The rumors are true. Most of the people who know you are aware of what is happening, but you are too dear to them to tell you. Tell me what? I asked a question that I already seem to know the answer to. That Peggy left you to be with Adam White. Adam White? Who is he? I've never heard of him. I asked in disbelief. He works with Peggy, Tom replied. So she just left me to live with him? Something doesn't add up. Why didn't she just file for divorce if she wanted to be with him? Why do we need separate accommodation? I started asking. You know Peggy, Rob, Tom replied. She planned everything carefully, creating backup plans and backup options in case the original plan didn't work out. After dating White for almost a year, it seems she initiated a breakup to have an outlet in case life with him didn't live up to her expectations. All my friends know about this, but no one deigned to tell me. Annoyed, I got up, threw my napkin on the table and sarcastically thanked them for their frankness, after which I ran out of the house. On the way home, I couldn't shake the disturbing realization of what I had just discovered. I haven't been intimate with Peg for over a year because she refused to be intimate with me. I couldn't snuggle up to her for over a year because she didn't want me to touch her, and all that time she betrayed me. I foolishly stayed at home, 
pretending to be a faithful partner while I waited for her to return. My so-called friends knew about her infidelity, but did nothing to help me, leaving me to sit alone, stare at the walls and wait. But finally, the wait was over. The next day, I arranged a meeting with the Corliss Investigative Agency and provided them with an advance payment. I shared information about Peg's place of work and her lover, asking for any information they could find about them. After that, I returned home and started making a checklist of things to do to end my relationship with Peg. I decided to wait for the detective agency's report before taking any action to be fully prepared. After making a list, I started thinking about other tasks that needed to be solved. It's been almost 16 months since I last had an intimate relationship. Peg refused me for a whole year, and then we broke up. Even though I was a faithful husband, I didn't want to remain celibate now that I knew the truth about Peg's infidelity. As I sat at the kitchen table thinking about how to end the drought, Tom's words about Peg's calculating nature echoed in my head. After living with her for so long, I realized that he was right. It dawned on me that she probably had a ready-made plan in case I ever found out about her actions. Perhaps she had already anticipated my reaction to learning about her plans, and the most ambitious of them was to live with White. I imagined her watching me, ready to use any slip I made against me in the event of a possible divorce. My carefully compiled list now seemed useless since she might have already planned my possible reaction. It's time to start over and make a new list, realizing that many of my desired actions will need to be done immediately and not postponed until the last moment. Time was running out, and I needed to act quickly to protect myself from her insidious tactics. I thought about various ways to harm Peg, but nothing came to mind. The next day I went to the bank to deposit my salary, and decided to check the safe that Peg and I shared. When I noticed that Peg regularly checked the cell, I realized that she was watching me. The realization made me wary, because I knew that she would act quickly if she sensed any suspicions on my part. I thought about this disturbing thought for a moment. I took out five certificates of deposit from plastic envelopes and headed upstairs to the bank's copier. I made copies of all five certificates, then put the originals in envelopes and put them back in the drawer. Until Peg gets the discs out to check them, she won't know anything about the exchange. Knowing that Peg was watching my actions, I cunningly mentioned to the bank employee, when she returned the box to its place, that I was going fishing to Mexico and casually took my passport out of the drawer. After leaving the bank, I had five discs safely hidden in my pocket. I usually visited the bank on average twice a week, cashing out one disc each time and paying a fine for early withdrawals. When I returned home, I hid the cash. I avoided credit cards for fear of getting into trouble. The only cards in my name were American Express, which required full payment upon receipt of the bill, several gas company cards, and a low-limit visa in my name only. On the other hand, Peg had an extensive collection of credit cards issued exclusively in her name, and some of them had significant limits. As the person responsible for paying the monthly bills, I was aware of the limits and diligently tracked the balances on each card. After making sure that they remain in good condition, I tried to make at least a minimum payment for each of them. After making a list of the things I needed, I spent the next few weeks using Peg's credit cards for my purchases. When I eventually leave, Peg will be left with a credit card debt. I was pleasantly surprised that I had significantly upgraded my computer. I bought a new Dell with all the latest features and a 700-gram Remington rifle on eBay, as well as a digital camera and a modern mobile phone that could do almost anything. The house belonged to Peg, inherited from her parents, so I didn't have ownership of it but we used it as collateral for a line of credit to install a pool and jacuzzi, and our names were on the bill. Fortunately, we have refunded the amount taken. The credit line is still available, and if I play my cards right, I can get access to it before she finds out about it. I was at a loss as to why she decided to keep me in her house when she said we needed a trial divorce instead of asking me to leave. But now everything has become clear. If I was still there, I would naturally expect her to come back. 
I would consider the breakup as a temporary setback. So I started acting. I cashed out my accounts at work, paid the fine, and hid the money. I leaned back in my chair and waited for the private investigator's report. The only thing that baffled me was how to find a way to act. I couldn't risk someone spying on me if I tried to go down this path, so I came up with a plan to leave town for the weekend under the guise of fishing. Peg knew about my love of fishing and my frequent trips, and she could see the evidence in the fish I brought home. I doubted very much that she would hire a detective to keep an eye on me for such a trifle. She didn't have to go overboard, right? Wasn't I a fool? Hasn't she been cheating on me for over a year? It was Friday, and when I was about to leave work, Taya called me and asked me to stop by on my way home. I tried to refuse, but she insisted that it was very important. Reluctantly, I agreed. Arriving at their place, Taya greeted me and led me into the living room, where I found Tom sitting in an easy chair. He stood up, held out his hand, and I shook it. Then he invited me to make myself comfortable while he brought me a beer. Tay needs to talk to you, Rob, and you need to know that I fully support whatever she says. With that, Tom left and headed for the kitchen. I exchanged a puzzled look with Taya, who then told me, Rob, you need a drink before we start talking. Tom came back with Bud Light in his hand and said he had a lot of work to do and would be back late. As he headed for the door, Taya took it as a hint to start a conversation. Rob, your sudden departure from dinner that night really offended us. Taya began the conversation. I wanted to speak out, but she stopped me and asked me to finish first. Although we understand your reasons, it still hurts us. We really care about you and didn't mean to offend you. It's a difficult situation because Peg and I are friends too, and we were hoping that she would understand that she belongs to you. We know that you have feelings for her, or at least you did. We weren't sure if what she did was enough for you to forgive her, so we chose to remain silent. If you have reconciled, not knowing that you will be able to live on without the burden of forgiveness, it is on our conscience. This is our apology, but it's only part of why Tom and I wanted to talk to you. We know about your past actions and we know what kind of person you are. You have a better chance of being faithful to your wife than committing a robbery. How long has it been since you were last close? The question caught me off guard. It was then that I noticed how Taya was dressed. She was wearing a low-cut blouse showing off her ample cleavage, a short skirt showing off her amazing legs, and high-heeled shoes that added to her charm. Despite our friendship, I couldn't help but feel a physical reaction. But when I remembered Tom's previous comment, which I completely agreed with, I realized where everything was going. In a low tone, I mentioned that it had been a year and a half since we had last crossed that line. Leaning closer, she whispered hoarsely, I'd like to change that, Rob. Feeling conflicted, I realized that I couldn't betray my friend Tom. I hesitated, about to get up, as the tension between us continued. She grabbed my arm and pulled me back down. Tom doesn't mind it, Rob. That's why he left to give us some time alone. It's not a pity. Tom and I have been talking about it for months. You have what we need, so hopefully I can help you and you can help us, she explained. I was caught off guard. I don't understand what you're talking about. I replied. She looked into my eyes and said, To put it bluntly, Rob, Tom is infertile and we want a baby. We want you to give it to me. I was stunned. I sat speechless and stared at her. You just said that you believed that I would never cheat on Peg, I said. Yes, she replied, putting her hand on the bulge in my trousers. But that was before you found out about Peg's actions. Now that you know the truth, you are no longer connected to her. So why me? I asked in disbelief. We want someone we know to be the father, not just a random person. We also want you to play a certain role in the child's life, to be the godfather and always be present as Uncle Rob, she replied. This is somehow wrong, Taya, I replied in protest. It makes sense, she insisted. What if something happens to me and Tom? Who else but Uncle Rob will take care of the baby? If suddenly a child needs a liver transplant or other similar medical procedure, will we be able to find an anonymous donor? And even if we do, 
Will they want to help? How long will we have to wait on the donor list to find a suitable candidate? We have carefully considered all possibilities, Rob, and we want you to become part of our family. Or are you saying that you don't find me attractive? She looked at me intently, started stroking me and said, Your actions speak louder than your words. She pulled me closer and whispered in my ear, Being the father of my child has its advantages, Rob. We will have to have an intimate relationship many times to make sure that I am pregnant. I won't limit you to just my most fertile days. In fact, I won't even say when it will happen. It could take weeks, even months, Rob. How long has it been for you? Touching her lips to my neck, she assured me, We will support each other on this journey. I hadn't had intimacy in a long time, and I knew I wouldn't last long. Now we can go into the bedroom and get serious about conceiving a child, Taya announced. All my doubts about the situation disappeared when she gave me pleasure, so I got up and followed her into the bedroom. I had heard that intense lovemaking increases the chances of conception, so I was ready to give it my all. No endearments, Rob. I want things to be different. Let's do our best and make this baby, she refused. She reached out, pulled me to her and whispered, Make love to me. I readily climbed onto the bed, and our passion flared up as we merged in pleasure. Our bond was stronger than all my previous contacts. Having reached the climax, Tanya propped herself up with a pillow so that my seed had every chance to hit the target. Watching her in such a vulnerable position, my desire increased again. I longed for another round. When we moved together for the second time, I couldn't help but hope that this time everything would be just as good, and I longed for the opportunity to repeat the pleasure that we found in each other. She tucked the pillow under her again, preparing for my departure, as we both longed for another moment of bliss. Before opening the front door to let me out, she kissed me and thanked me for my actions. She expressed a desire to continue doing this every day until she gets pregnant. But Tom is used to intimate moments three or four times a week. And although he doesn't mind, she doesn't want to give him leftovers. She asked me to call her tomorrow. On the way home, I couldn't stop thinking about what had just happened. This realization came to me when I drove up to the house. If Peg had really been watching me, she would have surely noticed my visits to Tom and Ty's house. She would have seen Tom leave, and I stayed for a few more hours after that. The next morning, I called Tay to express my concerns. To my surprise, Taya assured me that Tom hadn't actually gone anywhere. He just retired to his workshop in the basement and stayed there until I left. This new information made me stop and think. It was one thing to be intimate with Taya in Tom's absence, but the thought that he had been present all this time added a new level of complexity to the situation. Would I be able to do this if I knew he was in the house? Taya seemed to understand my thoughts because she looked sad. Don't worry, Rob. Everything will be fine. I promise, she said soothingly. Later that day, Tom called me and invited me to have a drink after work to discuss an unpleasant situation. Sitting with a friend I had known for 20 years and with whose wife I had just had an intimate relationship was extremely awkward. Tom must have sensed my discomfort because he addressed me directly. I know you're confused, Rob. Damn it, buddy. I'm embarrassed too. I need to have a serious talk with you about the situation we're in right now. I want to emphasize once again that I am completely satisfied with the agreement between you and Taya which I already mentioned when I left you alone. But there's something important that Taya hasn't fully revealed to you. She could have mentioned her desire to have a child and my infertility, but she didn't reveal the whole truth. The truth is that I have been struggling with dysfunction and intimacy for over a year now. That's why Taya seemed so passionate and passionate, Tom told me. She tried to make up for lost time, justifying herself by saying that she did not want to give Tom extra seconds to hide his male impotence. She didn't want me to think he was less masculine, although I wouldn't judge him. It was obvious that Taya put Tom first, even in difficult times, unlike Peg, who thought only of herself.
Tom continued by mentioning that Taya was very sexually energetic, unlike Peg. My inability to express myself sexually caused her great disappointment. Despite her efforts not to give up Rob, I knew that eventually she would seek intimacy elsewhere. It may seem cruel, but that was the reality. I understand that she cares about me and would try to hide her infidelity, but I would feel that something was wrong. How could I not have noticed? If she had found satisfaction elsewhere, her anxiety would have dissipated and I would have noticed the changes. I love her, Rob. She's everything to me. I would have been lost without her. But if she had betrayed me and cheated on me behind my back, I would not have been able to continue our relationship. Tom began to pour out his heart to me. I knew the reasons for her actions and could understand her motives, but I couldn't stand the deception. The only solution, in my opinion, was to face the situation head on. But Taya wasn't the kind of person who would agree to secretly date and have affairs behind my back. She could potentially act like this in a motel room with a stranger, but she couldn't bring herself to be with anyone else while I knew about it. We needed a consistent and sustainable solution, he said. We got together and brainstormed possible options, but we couldn't come to an agreement. Our thoughts kept coming back to you, but we hesitated because we were afraid that if we chose you and then Peg came back, our progress would stop and we would have to. We were sure that Peg would inevitably come back to you. Everyone knows that Adam White is a complete jerk, and Peg will quickly realize this and come back to you, confident that you don't know about her actions. I wonder why she underestimated your intelligence, Tom continued to say. She seems to think that your love for her is so strong that you will never suspect any deception on her part. I thought it was funny. In fact, she was quite right in her assumption, because the long separation made me realize that something was wrong. Now that you know the truth, and so do I, even if Peg is gone, it's clear that she's no longer a part of your life. This revelation allowed Taya and me to come and talk to you, Tom said. I want a baby, but unfortunately I have a problem that doctors can't solve yet. Therefore, until then, someone else will have to provide my wife, Tay, with a stable, intimate life. I know it may seem strange, but then making love to her can actually save my marriage. I'm not against it, but I need you to like this idea too, Tom finished. I couldn't find the words. The whole situation seemed surreal, even though it had happened once before. Tom looked at his drink, then back at me. The thought of not being able to take care of my wife, Rob, is heartbreaking, but the thought of losing her is even worse. I need you to do this for me, buddy. Can I rely on you? He asked. I looked at him, then nodded in agreement. On Sunday, I invited Tom, Taya, and three other couples to a barbecue. After the other couples left, Tom went to the office to use my computer, and Taya and I went up to my bedroom. While I was undressing, Taya lay on the bed and urged me to hurry up. In my house and on my bed we will do everything my way, I said. Tanya looked at me intently and noticed. Has Peg walked away from this? She must have lost her mind. Deciding to prove his point by jokingly telling her, Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. We laughed together, and I continued confidently. Although there was still a certain awkwardness in the air, I knew that openness would lead to nothing. Tom's statement about Ty's intimate attraction was confirmed. When I walked them to the car, Tom shook my hand tightly, Taya kissed me on the cheek, and we all agreed that it was a triumphant day, deciding to repeat it in the near future. To an outsider, it might have seemed that we were just discussing plans for another barbecue. I had a meeting with John Abbott from the Corliss Agency on Monday afternoon. Handing me the report, he apologized. I'm very sorry. Every time I have to provide reports like this, I hope it's just a misunderstanding. But unfortunately, this time it's not like that. Your fee also includes our representation in court, if it comes to that. I shook his hand, thanked him, and left the office. On the way home, I realized that I wasn't as angry as I expected. Perhaps this was due to the fact that deep down I had already come to terms with the harsh truth revealed in the report. By the time I got home, I was ready to face what lay ahead. What should I do with the situation that was spinning in my head?
It seemed that I had exhausted all my possibilities. There was only one solution left to use a home loan line without Peg's knowledge until it was too late to do anything. I planned to consult with a lawyer to prepare the necessary documents, but I have delayed submitting them for now. Over the next five weeks, I regularly met with Tom and Taya either at their home or at my place. They spread the word that I was going through difficult times and were there to support and encourage me during this difficult period. Peg called me once a week as usual, but this time I didn't bother to ask how she was doing or when she was coming home. I've reached a breaking point. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I wrote checks for our credit line, found a new apartment, and filed for divorce with Peg. The documents referred to irreconcilable differences, not adultery, because I didn't want Peg to find out that I knew White. I hoped that by solving the situation in this way, Peg would see it as my way of pushing her to decide to return home. I was sure she would call me soon. Peg sweetly suggested that we meet at a nice bar or restaurant to calm my worries and dissuade me from overreacting. I reluctantly agreed to meet with her, realizing at the same time that I needed time to take the next step. As we sat over drinks and dinner, she tried to convince me to reconsider my actions, but I just nodded, promising to think about it. She didn't know that I was buying time for my financial plans to fall into place. As predicted, I soon got a call and was urged to abandon the idea of involving lawyers and settle everything amicably. I expressed to her my fatigue from indecision, explaining that it was time for me to accept that she did not want to be with me and move on. Even though I agreed to meet her at Angelo's, seeing her for the first time after she left, I couldn't help but notice how good she looked. As much as I knew I was going to miss her, I also realized that I still loved her. But even if she came back to me, I knew that I would never be able to return to the old relationship. I kept it to myself during our meeting. I listened to her while she fed me a bunch of lies. She claimed that she goes to a therapist and he helps her cope with some unknown problem, blah, blah, blah. She insisted that she was making progress and she just needed a little more time. She begged me, saying she knew how hard it was for me, but it was just as hard for her. She begged for a little more time. I promised to think about it and give her an answer later. After waiting two days, I decided to take the next step and called my lawyer. It's time to move on. I refused the divorce papers and informed Peg that the lawsuit was canceled. While I was at work, Peg called me to express her gratitude and assure me that I would not regret my decision. I smiled, knowing that I didn't regret it, even though Peg didn't know the real reasons for my action but she will soon find out the truth. That evening I had dinner with Tom and Taya, and then Taya and I retired to her bedroom. Opening up to me, Taya expressed a desire to make love, wanting to share this intimate relationship with the father of her child. I asked if she was sure, to which she replied with unshakable confidence. On Tuesday, a home pregnancy test showed good news, and this afternoon the doctor confirmed it, you will become a dad, Taya said happily. It was only one night, but it was a long, leisurely, and incredibly enjoyable session. After everything was said and done, I told her that we might not see each other for a long time. I'm going to wrap up my business with Peg and White this week, and I may have to leave town for a while. Please don't make hasty decisions, Rob. I need the father of my child to be present, Tom said. That person is you, Tom. It's time to start thinking in these terms. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I told Tom. Adam White, a devoted member of the Fraternal Order of Eagles, has not missed a single meeting since he was elected Sergeant Attaché. As he left the meeting on Wednesday with a sense of hope after talking to influential members, he was thinking about putting himself forward for a higher position in the order. In the evening, when he parked his car outside his apartment, his good mood quickly turned to shock. A sudden excruciating pain seized him and everything went dark. A neighbor found him and immediately called the number 911. Paramedics quickly took him to the emergency department of the hospital, where they found fractures of both arms and legs, as well as serious injuries in the genital area. 
When he woke up in a hospital room, he was met with excruciating pain and the realization that he was immobilized. His limbs were in a cast and he was lying on a stretcher. As he drifted into consciousness, he caught a glimpse of Peggy's shocked expression by his bed. I was not present at this, but later I heard a detailed account of the events that took place. A man entered the room, approached Peggy, who was standing next to the bed, and asked if she was Margaret Olson. After verifying her identity, he handed her some papers, informing her that she had been handed a summons. When Peggy opened the envelope and discovered that she had been sued for divorce on the grounds of adultery, her confusion was very noticeable. When she looked at the word infidelity, her gaze shifted to the ruins spread out on the bed in front of her. A look of horror crossed her face as she realized the consequences. Sighing, she sank into a nearby chair, tears streaming down her cheeks. I remained at large until the authorities questioned me about my whereabouts on that fateful night. It turned out that I was playing poker during the Eagles meeting before White was hospitalized. Peg had unknowingly provided me with an alibi. The guys were willing to help for free, but the goal was to get back at Peg, so I decided to use her credit cards to express my gratitude. I used her Visa card to pay for digital cameras that I gave to Bill and Steve through a chain of home improvement stores. Her MasterCard was used to pay for the laptop I gave Mike and the 19-inch flat-screen monitor I gave Phil via eBay. In the end, she even paid for an aluminum bat. I had six weeks off and three weeks of work time, so I took two months off to implement my plan. After the police cleared me of any suspicion of involvement in White's misfortune, which could not be proved, I decided to leave the city to go fishing in Mexico. Before I left, I instructed my lawyer to suspend the divorce proceedings until Peg decides to challenge it. In the meantime, I would have remained married to her, but would not have participated in her life. I kept in touch with Tom and Taya, who informed me that Peg had returned home and looked genuinely happy. It seems that White's visit was not meant for Peg since she never returned to him after the day she learned the news from his hospital bed. Perhaps more and more credit card bills began to arrive in the mailbox, which indicated that their savings and checking accounts were empty. The credit line was exhausted, and even the CDs in the safe turned out to be fake. I soon found out that Peg was frantically searching for me, not finding any clues about my whereabouts, despite the fact that my boss was fully aware of the situation. When she called and started looking for me, she was told that I was unavailable. Peg was told that one day I suddenly appeared, announced my resignation, and demanded to pay my last salary. In fact, I misled her into thinking that I quit without warning. Although I didn't say it directly, my actions had such an effect on her. After she asked my lawyer to set up an appointment, she found out that I had called off the divorce proceedings, negotiated with him, and terminated his services. With no other options, she filed for bankruptcy a few months after I went fishing. After losing her home, she was forced to give up her Lexus and get behind the wheel of a used Gia. When I found out about her situation, I returned from Mexico and found an apartment on the other side of the city so I wouldn't have to deal with her. Taya, who was five months pregnant, looked even more attractive than before, and we quickly resumed our relationship. This time we didn't have to worry about anyone watching us, and we spent two or three nights a week together at either my place or hers. It's been two months since Peg found out the truth, and on that fateful day, I saw her waiting for me in the parking lot when I finished my shift. Ignoring her, I quickly got into the car and drove away, with Peg sitting on my tail. I slowed down to make sure she wasn't lagging behind, deciding to meet her away from prying eyes at our workplace. Ten minutes later, I pulled up to Bud's Bar and Grill, knowing that Peg would catch up with me sooner or later. As soon as I got inside, she pulled into the parking lot behind me, ready for the long overdue conversation that we both knew was going to take place. I was sitting at the bar and ordering Bud Light when she came in. Her eyes scanned the room until they settled on me, and with a determined look, she walked towards me. As she approached, she began to swear warning me not to try to escape her anger. I recognized Peg in her and realized what she was capable of. 
Without thinking, I quickly turned in my chair and grabbed her wrist when she tried to hit me. I held her tightly, making her gasp in pain. I have every reason to want to hurt you, Peg, I warned, so you better not push me too hard. Keep your hands to yourself if you don't want to experience real pain. I gently released her wrist, stating, I wasn't trying to avoid you. I drove slowly so that you could follow me. I had no intention of discussing our problems in the parking lot at my workplace. It doesn't matter. Because everyone there already knows that you are trash. I really want to talk to you, but at the same time, I don't want to. I'm tired of your lying words, I said. I want to return the money you owe me, and don't try to deny it. You took the money against the house, and half of our common property belongs to me. I want to get what is rightfully mine, she said defiantly. You're not getting anything from me, Peg, I replied just as defiantly. I believe that the amount I received is a fair compensation for the harm caused to me. What do lawyers call it when they sue? Compensation for pain, suffering, and loss of intimacy? I believe that the amount I received adequately compensates for the pain and suffering I experienced being deprived of intimacy for a year and a half while you were with another, and the humiliation I faced because everyone I knew thought I was a fool, I said angrily. Rob, I lost my parents' house because of you, she said in despair. So what, Peg? I replied, shrugging and grinning. Money doesn't seem to mean much to you since you've moved in with another man. I'm serious, Rob. I need this money, she insisted. But let me be clear, Peggy. You'll never see a penny from me. You tried to cheat me. You got caught. And you paid for it. You can handle it, I said. Let's see what the court decides, she hissed. Oh, it doesn't matter what the court says, Peggy. You'll have to hire a lawyer and sue me to get a divorce and divide our property, I said mockingly. If you decide to sue me, be prepared to counterclaim. A qualified lawyer can delay the process for eight months during which you will pay the legal costs. Can you really afford not to pay anything in return? I have all the evidence I need to defend myself in court, and if I come out victorious, you'll be left empty-handed. The worst-case scenario for me would be a division of property, which I would just agree to and leave. You and your lawyer will have to wait for the payment which will never come. You can try to contact me, but I won't answer your calls, and you'll have to keep paying your lawyer to no avail, I said threateningly. The case goes back to court, and I get a court order to pay it by a certain deadline. Despite the expectation and hopes, the deadline is passing, and I haven't paid a cent. Your lawyer keeps billing you for his time when he goes back to court and gets a ruling against me. Unfortunately, I don't have any savings or checking accounts that can be seized. My car is rented, so you can't claim it. Besides, I live in a furnished apartment which makes it impossible for you to repay the amount due, I continued. Your decision can only lead to an increase in my salary, but if it ever increases, I'll just quit my job. So what's the plan for the future, Peg? You'll spend a year paying for a lawyer just to potentially get $200 off one paycheck. Your only option is to ask the judge to threaten me with imprisonment for contempt of court if I don't follow his orders. But even if you follow this path, all you'll get is a postcard from me, sent from a quaint fishing village in Mexico, where I'll live until my funds run out. I ended my tirade with a grin. I owe you a huge debt, Peggy. Thanks to your betrayal, I've gained an advantage. Admit it, Peggy. You played with me and got caught, and now I've even the odds. You should count your lucky stars. Just think about what happened to your boyfriend. He paid the highest price, I added. Is that you? I had a feeling that you were involved in the situation with Adam, was all that a stunned Peg could say. But remember that assumptions are not the same as evidence, Peg, I replied. By the way, how is your relationship going? I heard you haven't visited him in the hospital since day one. Why? I asked, laughing. You have deprived him of the only valuable quality, she replied. That's cruel, Peg, even for you, I said, shaking my head. But it's true. He was good-looking and a wonderful lover. But eventually I would get bored and come back to you. If I had only known, all this drama could have been avoided, she replied simply. My actions certainly ruined everything, didn't they? 
The regret that I couldn't communicate better will haunt me to the grave. Life could have been much more enjoyable if we had just discussed everything, she said bitterly. You can be very unpleasant sometimes, Peg. And as for me, I'm just a badass crook, I replied. After finishing my beer, I stood up and bluntly told Peg to lead a miserable life, then left the bar. Three days later, I was handed the divorce papers, citing irreconcilable differences. I didn't dispute that. After the dissolution of the marriage, she received 50% of our common property, and I was obliged to return the money taken from our credit line to her. I casually declined to make a final decision, wishing her luck in trying to get something from me. Surprisingly, she never contacted me again, which indicates that she may have believed my predictions about the outcome of the case. Despite the confusing situation, one positive result was still found. Everyone agreed that White was a disrespectful person, but even people like him have a few real friends. One of White's friends turned out to be Peggy's boss, who was unhappy with her attitude towards White during a difficult period for him. As a result, he decided to fire her from her job. Peggy's departure from the company was not framed as a dismissal, but rather as a result of the economic downturn, which led to staff reductions. Despite this, the fact of her dismissal was well known. Unable to find a job in her district, Peggy decided to move to California, where she had relatives. Unfortunately, after the move, she did not communicate with anyone, not even with her sister. But despite such a grim turn of events, there is a bright side to this story. Taya gave birth to a beautiful girl, and Tom showered her with love and affection, bringing a sense of joy and new beginnings to the family. I became Uncle Rob and became a frequent visitor who spent countless hours playing with little Martha on the floor. Tom kept the true reason for his inability in pastels a secret from both Ty and me. He knew that the cause was cancer, which went unnoticed and spread. After Tom's funeral, Taya handed me an envelope with my name on it. On the front side it was written, For Rob's eyes only. When I looked at her she shrugged, making it clear that she didn't know what was inside. This letter is for you so I haven't seen its contents, Taya said. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to open it and read it. Inside was a message from a close friend informing me of his passing. He chose me, not Taya, as his child's guardian. He entrusted me with the responsibility of looking after his loved ones in his absence. I promised to fulfill this duty and not let him down. I shared the letter with Taya who was overwhelmed with emotion when she read it. I held her close, comforting her in this difficult moment. After crying out all her tears, she turned to me and asked about my plans. I answered confidently, I'm going to do exactly what you've already guessed. I will take care of my girls. And true to my word, six months later, Taya and I got married. Did you hear that Jason Benson is coming to us for the fourth time? My friend Jeff asked. It won't be for long, but the city authorities have chosen him to be the Grand Marshal of the Parade. Mayor Kane received this honor last year, and next year most likely he will be awarded again. It is very appropriate that the Independence Day Parade is led by a war hero. It's American. No, I haven't heard about it, I replied quietly. He must have already climbed quite high up the military ladder. I remember how many years ago he was just a captain. Jeff confirmed that he is already a colonel and is likely to receive an even bigger promotion soon. A year ago, he was wounded in Baghdad and received many medals and awards. Jeff predicted that he would eventually be able to lead the Pentagon. It took me a while to process this information. Jason Benson was considered the epitome of the all-American guy in our city. He was the best quarterback on the high school football team and a shortstop in baseball. He graduated at the top of his class and received offers from first division universities. He did well at West Point, graduated from high school one of the best in his class, played football and baseball. He was a talented athlete, soldier, and citizen, which I had to admit, although he possessed qualities that I did not have. Usually his success didn't bother me, but there was one problem. Even at school, he dated Sarah, who has now become my wife. 
At school, everyone thought Sarah was perfect for Jason. She was an outstanding athlete, the second best student in her class, and was considered the most beautiful girl in Williamsport. Despite the fact that they broke up when Jason enrolled at West Point and Sarah at Temple, they never resumed their relationship. At school, I was two years older than them, not the best student, but still successful. I studied at a public school in the Faculty of Engineering and became increasingly interested in programming as computers increasingly appeared in my daily life. I had experience working for several companies before I finally plucked up the courage to open my own. The decision to marry Sarah still haunts me, but somehow I convinced her. This remains the greatest achievement of my life, or at least the most significant step taken on my own. Our two daughters are a joint effort and a source of pride for us. Sarah rarely mentioned Jason, understanding my discomfort about this story from her past. Invariably kind-hearted people mentioned his name from time to time. I was constantly intimidated by their expectations that I should value Jason highly and support his idea of being with Sarah. It seemed that my own thoughts and emotions about Jason were not being taken into account. Many people thought that Sarah would have been better off if she had stayed with Jason. But I want to praise Sarah's parents for never hinting at anything like this. Many years ago, at a family picnic, I witnessed Sarah's mother visibly upset when one of her cousins expressed the opinion that Sarah should have married Jason. It was a thoughtless and hurtful comment that only a fool could make. In front of the shocked and silent crowd, she quickly put her cousin in his place. She defended Sarah's husband Greg and me, stressing what a wonderful husband and father I am, and made it clear that my cousin's statement was completely ignorant and unfounded. Sarah's mother's sudden lunge made her smile, and she surreptitiously squeezed my hand under the table. Sarah has always treated me with love and respect, never making it clear that I am not the perfect husband for her. So why didn't I feel worthy enough? I was constantly compared to Jason Benson, a hero who was admired. It constantly seemed to me that I was not up to him either in my own eyes or in the eyes of others. My conversation with Jeff ended when April, my daughter, grabbed a basketball from the opposing team's defender and rushed ahead of everyone. Both of my daughters played basketball in the summer league, and April's speed and aggressiveness made her a formidable opponent. The other girls didn't seem to want to meet her on the playground, except for June, my eldest daughter. June was distinguished by her grace and natural ease of movement, which made her an outstanding player. She decided to get a volleyball scholarship to go to Temple in the fall, although she could have chosen basketball. April, a junior in high school, was a key player on the basketball team that was aiming to win the district and get to the state championship. I always enjoyed watching my daughters play sports because they excelled in every sport and always gave their best. Their natural speed and athleticism, inherited from Sarah, allowed them to become the best athletes. June recently became the best in her class, and the coaches awarded her a scholarship. April was also a strong contender for the first place. When the game ended, I came out of the stands to meet the girls as they shook hands with their rivals. June asked me, It's not a bad game, is it, Dad? April dominated the court, not allowing the other team to go beyond the half court. In the end, the coach asked April to loosen up her defense, reminding her that they were playing to win and not just like that. April explained that she did not want to suppress the morale of the other team by playing too aggressive. June followed her example, giving her rivals a chance to catch up with her, but in the end, she still became the top scorer of the game. Well, girls, Summer League promises to be a fun time for all the kids. When we discussed our goals at the very beginning, we decided to focus on developing sportsmanship and teamwork, I recall. Coach Simons made a big impression on me today. Dad, you always strive to make everyone happy, except when you compete with us. You never treat April and me lightly when we play at home, June remarked. That's because I know that both of you are tough, both mentally and physically. I want you to understand how important it is to never give up and give your best. When it comes to school league games, 
No one underestimates you, right? You have to understand the level of competition and adjust your game accordingly. Do you think I will succeed in business if I constantly let my clients win at golf? It's a difficult balance, Dad. It may be easier for you to lose to your clients, but June can definitely beat you on the golf course. I doubt you can handle them easily, April joked. You may not be the best golfer in the world, but you definitely have some skills, young lady, I encouraged April. I realized that it is important to show diligence and be merciful in defeats. This is the key to success in the golf business. It's good that you explained this to June, Dad, because she plays so well that she can start losing customers right and left. She doesn't follow your advice. April teased her sister. Maybe she should watch you play to get some tips. When we arrived at the house, I did not try to come up with a suitable answer. I knew that I could always succeed by coaching and teaching children sports, even better than playing with them. Sarah, a natural athlete, passed on her skills to our daughters. Unlike me, who had to strain to keep up, Sarah moved easily behind us. The girls willingly shared with her the details of their day and game when we entered the house, and I was delighted with their connection. How did three amazing women end up in my life? Sarah, a successful professional in the field of hotel business, contrary to her parents' desire to become a lawyer, took up her own business. After graduating from university, she quickly rose through the ranks at a local hotel and conference center, part of a large chain. Despite reaching the top job two years ago, she declined a promotion that would have required her to move to Kansas. Sarah, was there anything special today? I asked. You look a little more dressed up than usual and you had to stay late. Did the top management of the corporation come to the city for the holiday? No, but you're very attentive, Greg, Sarah admitted. The day after tomorrow will be the fourth, and we always sponsor the Grand Marshal's expedition. This year, the newspaper wanted to print some photos before the parade. Suddenly, I was overcome by a wave of inner trembling. I noticed that Sarah's silence was a wake-up call for me. Sarah, our beloved golden boy and war hero was supposed to come to the city for filming. You missed the fact that he will also be the Grand Marshal at the parade. Will he be filming with you? I asked. Sarah clenched her hands convulsively and looked around the room for other distractions. Her usual composure faltered, which piqued my interest. Sarah explained that the hotel had generously donated a room for a local military hero. She claimed that it was all about good public relations, since the hero's parents had moved from Williamsport, and he had nowhere to stay. Sarah reasoned that it made sense to give a number to a man who was wounded in the service of his country and acted as the Grand Marshal at the upcoming Fourth of July parade. It's just good business, she insisted raising her voice slightly. I couldn't help but ask her why she was so worried if there was nothing to worry about. Sarah reluctantly admitted, No, well, maybe a little. It's just that we've always tried to avoid the subject of Jason. I know how you feel about the fact that we dated in high school and how annoying it is when people keep mentioning his name. This is strictly a business matter, Greg. You are my husband and the only man I love and have ever loved. You have to believe it. I replied, I'm very pleased to hear you say that, Sarah, and I want to believe you. The question arose, why did you find it necessary to hide information about Jason's return from me? Sarah replied, I knew it was a sore subject, and I didn't want you to worry or get upset. He just doesn't mean anything to me. I objected, then I shouldn't have any reason to be upset, and you shouldn't have any reason to hide information from me, right? No, Greg, not really. I am glad that we are openly discussing this. Jason's ghost has been hovering over us since we tied the knot, or even before, I added. So are there any other events planned in Marshall? Colonel Benson will lead the parade and organize an informal reception at the hotel the next day, Sarah said. The hotel will provide snacks and drinks and people will have a chance to make a good impression on it. I suppose you're going to do this, Sarah, I asked. Yes, Greg. As the caretaker of the hotel, it's part of my job. If anyone benefits from building goodwill and connections, it's me, Sarah said. Do you have a problem with that? 
I don't think it matters, Sarah. The piggy bank has already been abandoned. Plans have been determined. I may not be involved in this, but I can handle it if you're honest with me. He doesn't mean anything to you, does he? You're not going to look at him like a deer at headlights, are you? Sarah reacted to my statement with annoyance, but her expression quickly changed to a smile when she caught my pun. She hugged me and expressed her love, saying, Greg, I love you so much. You are the only man who has ever attracted the attention of this doe or any other part of her body. We both laughed at her playful remark. I hope this applies to everything, not just your eyes, I replied with a smile. Sarah replied, You know that's all I have, honey. Sarah whispered softly, It's all one of a kind, and it's all for you. After walking through the living room, we told the girls that we were too tired to eat and were going to bed. They'll have to make do with the roast beef left over from last night. Too tired, June giggled. Looks like we'd better cover our ears. The last time you were so exhausted you kept us up half the night. Sarah blushed and said, Maybe we should wait until the girls are asleep, and closed our bedroom door. I don't want them to get suspicious. They already think that we have some kind of intimate business, I told Sarah, and we engaged in intimacy. The next night, when Sarah was cooking dinner, I casually asked how her day had been, knowing that I was really asking about Jason and what was going on between them. It went well, Greg, she replied. Jason has become even more determined and energetic than he was at school. I think his service as an officer and participation in the war developed his natural leadership qualities, Sarah replied. Sarah, I appreciate your point of view on Jason's growth as a leader, but let's be honest. When I asked you for honesty, I didn't expect you to praise him. I want to know the truth about his flaws and why you chose me over him. That kind of honesty is exactly what I want to hear. Greg, even if this guy is an army ranger and a war hero, all tough and tough, he's still no match for you. That's the spirit. Can you tell me the details? I asked. Well, the President of the United States personally called Jason today to thank him for his outstanding service. But don't forget that just two years ago you were the Vice President of the Loss Club. Jason is not even a member of the club. I nodded in agreement. The guy probably thinks he's too good for the club, I said. He will never become the treasurer of a football club, that's for sure. He's a loser. Sarah nodded in agreement and said, That's exactly what I was thinking. Most likely, tomorrow after the parade, he will also fail his interview on Fox News, and his book is sure to be boring. Most likely, he will not become a general until he is 50 years old. That's what I'm talking about, I added. I almost screamed. This is a real test of character. There should be rewards for this. Anyone can get into trouble. I have to admit, Greg, it helps a lot when we communicate honestly and in an adult way, Sarah grinned. No one compares to my man, she added. I hugged Sarah, hugging her to me and hugged her tightly. When she looked up at me, I kissed her passionately. Why don't the two of us find a more private place? Someone joked. April came into the room and said, this is the kitchen where I cook. Sarah blushed and tried to move away, but I held her back. She looked at me and I kissed her again. Dad, you really love Mom, don't you? April teased. Do you think I'll ever find someone who loves me the same way? She asked. Not until you graduate from college, I replied. You won't have any trouble finding guys, Sarah admired. April's face turned red with embarrassment. Feeling my own cheeks heat up, I quickly turned around and walked towards the garage. It suddenly dawned on me that the backyard still needed to be mowed. Raising daughters can be difficult. The parade became a hit, and cable news crews covered Colonel Benson, a rising star who embodied everything the media wanted to see on Independence Day. After watching his evening interview, I had to admit that he is a charismatic and well-spoken person. There was pride in him when he talked about being an American. The day after the parade was full of chaos. Sarah left early to make sure everything was in order for the open house they were hosting for Benson. The presence of a cable news crew staying at her hotel only added to her stress. 
Deciding to express my gratitude for everything Sarah does for me and the girls, I went into Jeff's jewelry store. After considering several options, I settled on a pair of diamond earrings as a token of appreciation. Jeff tried to convince me to buy a necklace, but I had already exhausted my budget and bought her earrings. I walked around the main conference room watching the colonel. Despite the fact that everyone in the city seemed to look down on him, he remained humble and polite, earning my respect. Sarah effectively controlled the event, making sure that everything went smoothly. The hotel had a good reputation in the city, thanks to a well-organized business. The event was supposed to end by 6 o'clock. At 7.30, a handful of acolytes and fans lingered, unwilling to leave until the free food and drinks were over. Anticipating the imminent end of the meeting, I slipped into Sarah's office unnoticed. My plan was to surprise her with the earrings I brought, and then pass on an invitation to a neighborhood party where she could show off the new jewelry in front of her friends. After waiting for Sarah for 15 minutes, I decided to use her toilet. As I was finishing washing my hands, the sound of the office door closing caught my attention. My smile quickly disappeared when I realized that a man's voice was now heard in the room. The door to the room was slightly ajar, which allowed me to easily eavesdrop on the conversation. Sarah, I can't help but tell you again you look amazing. Just being around you is driving me crazy. You're still the most beautiful woman I've ever been with. My stomach rumbled and sweat broke out on my forehead. I felt dizzy and had to lean on her to keep from falling. This is very flattering, Colonel, but please refrain from making such statements about me. I'm happily married, and I don't want any misunderstandings. Sarah replied firmly. It was a long time ago. Let's leave it in the past. Sarah, I feel like there's still something between us. I noticed this during our work together in the last few days, and please call me Jay. Jason continued. I agreed to come here for the holidays just to see you again, and I have to say it was worth it. Surely you wanted to show off in front of the residents of your hometown during the parade, Jason. You are a local guy who has achieved great success. Sarah expressed her admiration for his bravery and achievements, recognizing him as a true war hero. Benson begged Sarah to join him, as he had to leave early the next morning. He offered to make love to express gratitude for his contribution to the development of the country and her personally. The thought made me feel sick, but I held back the urge to vomit, knowing that Sarah would find out that I was eavesdropping. I concentrated on breathing to keep my composure. I managed to pull myself together and calm down. I'm married, Jason, Sarah reasoned. My husband would have suspected something right away. He would be upset, to put it mildly. I saw him, Sarah, Benson replied. He is not one of those who creates problems. I've had a lot of people like him under my command. They never challenged me. He won't dare tell you anything. Benson reasoned that girls' soccer practice and a change of clothes did not prepare a man for battle. I could feel the contempt in Benson's voice as he chuckled at his comment. It was clear that he didn't have much respect for me. Jason, why don't you stay a few more days if you want to see me more often? Sarah asked. Her tone was devoted. I can free your room from unnecessary hassle and make it accessible. I can't, Sarah, Jason replied. I have to go to Washington tomorrow. It's all part of climbing the corporate ladder. I've devoted more than 20 years and a lot of effort to this cause, and I am getting closer to the goal. Sarah asked Jason if it was true that rangers have a rule of not abandoning a comrade, to which Jason proudly confirmed. He explained that they take an oath to always watch each other's backs, emphasizing the importance of trust. Sarah offered to go to her room, teasing Jason with the opportunity to spend the night with a real hero. Jason found her offer tempting. Sarah asked, I don't quite understand some things. Could you explain them to me first? Jason replied, Of course, Sarah. I will be happy to explain everything so that we can move on to a sweet night. Sarah continued, Why do you think you're better than my husband? Do heroes have to have medals and badges to be considered heroes? Jason replied, I'm not sure I understand the question, but... Benson replied slowly, Your husband has never put his life at risk. He had never served in the war, 
He stayed at home, supported classes for girls, and attended parent-teacher conferences. He didn't do anything courageous. Sarah objected. Greg took over our daughter's soccer team when the coach was injured in a car accident, and no one else volunteered. At first, he didn't even know the rules. He spent time studying books and searching the internet to learn. Despite the difficulties and mistakes, he remained the mainstay for the team, especially for the girls. He didn't just take care of my father after the stroke, showing his love and dedication. Sarah proudly called me her hero, and Benson recognized my good qualities, despite his doubts about men who do not perform such duties. Jason, this reaction is unacceptable. Greg worked the night shift all year to be able to attend events for girls. The following year he got two jobs to help us save up for the down payment on the house. When he found our daughter June smoking in the garage with her friends, he put her on her knees in front of them and spanked her. June burst into tears, expressed her hatred for him and ran to her room. He stayed up all night worrying about her. The next day she apologized and vowed never to smoke again and then hugged him, Sarah recalls. This is what it means to be a real family man, Jason she remarked. But how could you expect me to break my oath? You preach honesty, and yet you don't hesitate to demand that I give up my own, she said, her tone becoming more and more dispassionate. You claim that you have devoted so much time to your career and don't want to risk it, but what about my career and investments? Sarah continued. You didn't hesitate to jeopardize my job and my marriage by bragging about your achievements, do you really value me and my life so low? Haven't I spent two decades building my life, my marriage, my career? She demanded answers. After listening to your point of view, Sarah, I understand that I could get carried away. I just think you're incredibly beautiful, and we've had some unforgettable moments, Benson admitted hesitantly. But those memories belong to you, not me, Jason, Sarah replied. I remember feeling guilty for not letting Greg become my first love. I remember how narcissistic you were. I remember feeling relieved when you left for West Point and didn't come back to Williamsport very often. These are the memories I'm holding on to. Benson's dry reply took me by surprise. Wow, I didn't know you felt that way, Sarah. With a curt nod, he excused himself and abruptly left, closing the door behind him. I hesitated in the bathroom, afraid that Sarah would find out that I had overheard their conversation. Fortunately, I heard the office door open and close again, which meant she was gone. After making sure everything was clear, I headed to my car, and crossing the parking lot, dialed Jeff's number. Later, while helping the girls in the kitchen, I anxiously waited for Sarah's return. When she finally came in, I couldn't help but say, Sarah, I'm so glad you're home. She explained that she was busy with paperwork, but I pulled her to me and kissed her, feeling a surge of emotion. When I hugged her, my heart was filled with joy to the brim. In the end, I pulled away, unable to contain my feelings for her. Wow, Mom, Dad looks very pleased when he sees you, doesn't he? June giggled. I hope my husband will greet me the same way after two decades of marriage. Sarah was looking at me, trying to figure out why I was so glad to see her and why I didn't need to explain my lateness. June, I would like you to find a husband like our dad, Sarah nodded in agreement. He is always full of surprises and loves his family very much. I took a small, beautifully wrapped package out of the drawer and handed it to Sarah. She carefully took it from me and examined it carefully. Mom, open it, April exclaimed impatiently. I want to see what's inside. Sarah's hands trembled slightly as she carefully unwrapped the gift, putting the paper aside, and then picked up the box. With a sense of anticipation, she slowly lifted the lid. At the sight of what was inside, tears welled up in the eyes of three pairs of people. The room was filled with a feeling of warmth and tenderness, and the air enveloped the space. I carefully inserted the earrings into her ears, and my daughters noticed my expression. Dad, are you crying? June asked. I replied that these were tears of joy, and there is no one in the world better than our mother.